The Pacific War, sometimes called the Asia-Pacific War, was the theater of World War II that was fought in Asia, the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and Oceania. It was geographically the largest theater of the Second World War, including the vast Pacific Ocean Theater, the Southwest Pacific Theater, the Second Sino-Japanese War, and the Soviet-Japanese War. The Second Sino-Japanese War between the Empire of Japan and the Republic of China had been in progress since the 7th of July 1937, with hostilities dating back as far as the 19th of September 1931 with the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. However, it is more widely accepted that the Pacific War itself began on the 7th of December 1941 or the 8th of December 1941, Japanese time, when the Japanese simultaneously invaded Thailand, attacked the British colonies of Malaya, Singapore, and Hong Kong, as well as the United States military and naval bases in Hawaii, Wake Island, Guam, and the Philippines. The Pacific War saw the Allies pitted against Japan, the latter aided by Thailand, and to a lesser extent by the Axis Allies, Germany, and Italy. Fighting consisted of some of the largest naval battles in history, and incredibly fierce battles, and war crimes, across Asia and the Pacific Islands, resulting in immense loss of human life. In 1931, without declaring war, Japan invaded Manchuria, seeking raw materials to fuel its growing industrial economy. By 1937, Japan controlled Manchuria and it was also ready to move deeper into China. The Marco Polo Bridge incident on the 7th of July 1937 provoked full-scale war between China and Japan. The Nationalist Party and the Chinese Communists suspended their civil war in order to form a nominal alliance against Japan, and the Soviet Union quickly lent support by providing large amounts of materiel to Chinese troops. In August 1937, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek deployed his best army to fight about 300,000 Japanese troops in Shanghai, but, after three months of fighting, Shanghai fell. The Japanese continued to push the Chinese forces back, capturing the capital Nanjing in December 1937 and conducted the Nanjing Massacre. In March 1938, nationalist forces won their first victory at Kaiyuzhuo, but then the city of Shizhou was taken by the Japanese in May. In June 1938, Japan deployed about 350,000 troops to invade Wuhan and captured it in October. The Japanese achieved major military victories, but world opinion, in particular in the United States, condemned Japan, especially after the Panay Incident. In 1939, Japanese forces tried to push into the Soviet Far East from Manchuria. They were soundly defeated in the Battle of Kalten Gulf by a mixed Soviet and Mongolian force, led by Georgi Zhukov. This stopped Japanese expansion to the north, and Soviet aid to China ended as a result of the signing of the Soviet-Japanese Neutrality Pact at the beginning of its war against Germany. In September 1940, Japan decided to cut China's only land line to the outside world by seizing French Indochina, which was controlled at the time by Vichy France. Japanese forces broke their agreement with the Vichy administration and fighting broke out, ending in a Japanese victory. On the 27th of September 1940 Japan signed a military alliance with Germany and Italy, becoming one of the three main Axis powers. In practice, there was little coordination between Japan and Germany until 1944, by which time the US was deciphering their secret diplomatic correspondence. Admiral Sankichi Takahashi was reported as saying a showdown with the United States was necessary. In an effort to discourage Japanese militarism, Western powers including Australia, the United States, Britain, and the Dutch government in exile, which controlled the petroleum-rich Dutch East Indies, stopped selling oil, iron ore, and steel to Japan, denying it the raw materials needed to continue its activities in China and French Indochina. In Japan, the government and nationalists viewed these embargoes as acts of aggression. Imported oil made up about 80% of domestic consumption, without which Japan's economy, let alone its military, would grind to a halt. The Japanese media, influenced by military propagandists, began to refer to the embargoes as the ABCD or American British Chinese Dutch Encirclement, or ABCD Line. Faced with a choice between economic collapse and withdrawal from its recent conquests, with its attendant loss of face, the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters, GHQ, began planning for a war with the Western powers in April or May 1941. In Japanese preparation for the war against the United States, which would be decided at sea, and in the air, Japan increased its naval budget as well as putting large formations of the army and its attached air force under Navy command. 
While formerly the IJA consumed the lion's share of the state's military budget due to the secondary role of the IJN in Japan's campaign against China, with a 73-27 split in 1940, from 1942 to 1945 there would instead be a roughly 60-40th split in funds between the army and the navy. Japan's key objective during the initial part of the conflict was to seize economic resources in the Dutch East Indies and Malaya, which offered Japan a way to escape the effects of the Allied embargo. This was known as the Southern Plan. It was also decided, because of the close relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States, and the mistaken belief that the U.S. would inevitably become involved, that Japan would also require taking the Philippines, Wake Island, and Guam. Japanese planning was for fighting a limited war where Japan would seize key objectives and then establish a defensive perimeter to defeat Allied counterattacks, which in turn would lead to a negotiated peace. The attack on the U.S. Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by carrier-based aircraft of the combined fleet was intended to give the Japanese time to complete a perimeter. The early period of the war was divided into two operational phases. The first operational phase was further divided into three separate parts in which the major objectives of the Philippines, British Malaya, Borneo, Burma, Rabaul, and the Dutch East Indies would be occupied. The second operational phase called for further expansion into the South Pacific by seizing Eastern New Guinea, New Britain, Fiji, Samoa, and strategic points in the Australian area. In the Central Pacific, Midway was targeted as were the Aleutian Islands in the North Pacific. Seizure of these key areas would provide defensive depth and deny the Allies staging areas from which to mount a counteroffensive. By November 1941, these plans were essentially complete and were modified only slightly over the next month. Japanese military planners' expectation of success rested on the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union being unable to effectively respond to a Japanese attack because of the threat posed to each by Germany, the Soviet Union was even seen as unlikely to commence hostilities. The Japanese leadership was aware that a total military victory in a traditional sense against the U.S. was impossible. The alternative would be negotiating for peace after their initial victory, which would recognize Japanese hegemony in Asia. In fact, the Imperial General Headquarters noted, should acceptable negotiations be reached with the Americans, the attacks were to be cancelled, even if the order to attack had already been given. The Japanese leadership looked to base the conduct of the war against America on the historical experiences of the successful wars against China, 1894-1895, and Russia, 1904-1905, in both of which a strong continental power was defeated by reaching limited military objectives, not by total conquest. They also planned, should the United States transfer its Pacific fleet to the Philippines, to intercept an attack this fleet en route with the combined fleet, in keeping with all Japanese Navy pre-war planning and doctrine. If the United States, or Britain, attacked first, the plans further stipulated the military were to hold their positions and wait for orders from general headquarters. The planners noted that attacking the Philippines, and British Malaya, still had possibilities of success, even in the worst case of a combined preemptive attack including Soviet forces. Following prolonged tensions between Japan and the Western powers, units of the Imperial Japanese Navy and Imperial Japanese Army launched simultaneous surprise attacks on the United States and the British Empire on the 7th of December or the 8th of December 1941 in Asia's West Pacific time zones. The locations of this first wave of Japanese attacks included the American territories of Hawaii, the Philippines, Guam, and Wake Island, and the British territories of Malaya, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Concurrently, Japanese forces invaded southern and eastern Thailand and were resisted for several hours before the Thai government signed an armistice and entered an alliance with Japan. Although Japan declared war on the United States and the British Empire, the declaration was not delivered until after the attacks began. Subsequent attacks and invasions followed during December 1941 and early 1942, leading to the occupation of American, British, Dutch and Australian territories and air raids on the Australian mainland. The Allies suffered many disastrous defeats in the first six months of the war. In the early hours of the 7th of December 1941, Hawaiian time, Japan launched a major surprise carrier-based airstrike on Pearl Harbor, in Honolulu, without explicit warning, which crippled the U.S. Pacific fleet, left eight American battleships out of action, destroyed 188 American aircraft, and caused the deaths of 2,403 Americans. The Japanese had gambled that the United States, when faced with such a sudden and massive blow and loss of life, would agree to a negotiated settlement and allow Japan free reign in Asia. This gamble did not pay off. American losses were less serious than initially thought. The three American aircraft carriers, 
which would prove to be more important than battleships, were at sea, and vital naval infrastructure, three oil tanks, shipyard facilities, and a power station submarine base, and signals intelligence units were unscathed, and the fact the bombing happened while the U.S. was not officially at war anywhere in the world caused a wave of outrage across the United States. Japan's fallback strategy, relying on a war of attrition to make the U.S. come to terms, was beyond the IJM's capability. Before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the 800,000-member America First Committee vehemently opposed any American intervention in the European conflict, even as America sold military aid to Britain and the Soviet Union through the Lend-Lease program. Opposition to war in the U.S. vanished after the attack. On the 8th of December, the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, and the Netherlands declared war on Japan, followed by China and Australia the next day. Four days after Pearl Harbor, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States, drawing the country into a two-theater war. This is widely agreed to be a grand strategic blunder, as it abrogated both the benefit Germany gained by Japan's distraction of the U.S. and the reduction in aid to Britain, which both Congress and Hitler had managed to avoid during over a year of mutual provocation, which would otherwise have resulted. Thailand, with its territory already serving as a springboard for the Malayan campaign, surrendered within five hours of the Japanese invasion. The government of Thailand formally allied with Japan on the 21st of December 1941. To the south, the Imperial Japanese Army had seized the British colony of Penang on the 19th of December 1941, encountering little resistance. Hong Kong was attacked on the 8th of December 1941 and fell on the 25th of December 1941, with Canadian forces and the Royal Hong Kong Volunteers playing an important part in the defense. American bases on Guam and Wake Island were lost at around the same time. British, Australian, and Dutch forces already drained of personnel and materiel by two years of war with Germany and heavily committed in the Middle East, North Africa, and elsewhere, were unable to provide much more than token resistance to the battle-hardened Japanese. Two major British warships, the battlecruiser HMS Repulse and the battleship HMS Prince of Wales, were sunk by a Japanese air attack off Malaya on the 10th of December 1941. Following the declaration by United Nations, the first official use of the term United Nations on the 1st of January 1942, the Allied governments appointed the British General Sir Archibald Wavell, the American British Dutch Australian Command, ABDACOM, Supreme Command for Allied Forces in Southeast Asia. This gave Sir Archibald Wavell nominal control of a huge force, albeit thinly spread over an area from Burma to the Philippines to Northern Australia. Other areas, including India, Hawaii, and the rest of Australia, remained under separate local commands. On the 15th of January 1942, Sir Archibald Wavell moved to Bandung in Java to assume control of ABDACOM. In January 1943, Japan invaded British Burma, the Dutch East Indies, New Guinea, the Solomon Islands and captured Manila, Kuala Lumpur and Rabaul. After being driven out of Malaya, Allied forces in Singapore attempted to resist the Japanese during the Battle of Singapore, but were forced to surrender to the Japanese on the 15th of February 1942. About 130,000 Indian, British, Australian and Dutch personnel became prisoners of war. The pace of conquest was rapid. Bali and Timor also fell in February. The rapid collapse of Allied resistance left the ABDA area split in two. Wavell resigned from ABDACOM on 25 February 1942, handing control of the ABDA area to local commanders and returning to the post of Commander-in-Chief, India. Meanwhile, Japanese aircraft had all but eliminated Allied air power in Southeast Asia and were making air attacks on Northern Australia, beginning with a psychologically devastating but militarily insignificant bombing of the city of Darwin on 19 February 1942, which killed at least 243 people. At the Battle of the Java Sea in late February and early March, the Imperial Japanese Navy, IJN, inflicted a resounding defeat on the main ABDA naval force, under Admiral Carol Gorman. The Dutch East Indies campaign subsequently ended with the surrender of Allied forces on Java and Sumatra. In March and April, a powerful IJN carrier force launched a raid into the Indian Ocean. British Royal Navy bases in Ceylon were hit and the aircraft carrier HMS Hermes and other Allied ships were sunk. The attack forced the Royal Navy to withdraw to the western part of the Indian Ocean. This paved the way for a Japanese assault on Burma and India. In Burma, the Japanese captured Mulmain on the 31st of January 1942, and then drove outnumbered British and Indian troops towards the Satang River. 
On the 23rd of February 1942, a bridge over the river was demolished prematurely, stranding most of an Indian division on the far side. On the 8th of March, the Japanese occupied Rangoon, although they missed a chance to trap the remnants of the Burma army within the city. The Allies then tried to defend central Burma, with Indian and Burmese divisions holding the Irrawaddy River Valley and the Chinese Expeditionary Force in Burma defending Tongu, south of Mandalay. On the 16th of April, 7,000 British soldiers were encircled by the Japanese 33rd Division during the Battle of Nong Nong and rescued by the Chinese 38th Division, led by Sun Wu Jen. Meanwhile, in the Battle of Yunnan Burma Road, the Japanese captured Tungu after a severe battle and sent motorized units to capture Latvia. This cut the Burma Road, which was the Western Allies' supply line to the Chinese nationals. Many of the Chinese troops were trapped and were forced either to retreat to India or in small parties to Yunnan. Accompanied by large numbers of civilian refugees, the British retreated to Imphal in Manipur, abandoning most of their transport and equipment. They reached Imphal in May just as the monsoon descended, which effectively halted operations. Within China, cooperation between the Chinese nationalists and the communists had waned from its peak at the Battle of Wuhan, and the relationship between the two had gone sour as both attempted to expand their areas of operation in occupied territories. The Japanese exploited this lack of unity to press ahead in their offensives. On the 8th of December 1941, Japanese bombers struck American airfields on Luzon. They caught most of the planes on the ground, destroying 103 aircraft, more than half of the U.S. air strength. Two days later, further raids led to the destruction of the Kabini Naval Yard, south of Manila. By the 13th of December, Japanese attacks had wrecked every major airfield and virtually annihilated American air power. During the previous month before the start of hostilities, a part of the U.S. Asiatic fleet had been sent to the southern Philippines. However, with little air protection, the remaining surface vessels in the Philippines, especially the larger ships, were sent to Java or to Australia. With their position also equally untenable, the remaining American bombers flew to Australia in mid-December. The only forces that remained to defend the Philippines were the ground troops, a few fighter aircraft, about 30 submarines, and a few small vessels. On the 10th of December 1941, Japanese forces began a series of small-scale landings on Luzon. The main landings by the 14th Army took place at Lingayan Gulf on the 22nd of December 1941, with the bulk of the 16th Infantry Division. Another large second landing took place two days later at Laman Bay, south of Manila, by the 48th Infantry Division. As the Japanese troops converged on Manila, General Douglas MacArthur began executing plans to make a final stand on the Bataan Peninsula and the island of Corregidor in order to deny the use of Manila Bay to the Japanese. A series of withdrawal actions brought his troops safely into Bataan, while the Japanese entered Manila unopposed on 2 January 1942. On 7 January 1942, the Japanese attacked Bataan. After some initial success, they were stalled by disease and casualties, but they could be reinforced while the Americans and Filipinos could not. On the 11th of March 1942, under orders from President Roosevelt, MacArthur fled Corregidor for Australia, and Lieutenant General Jonathan M. Wainwright assumed command in the Philippines. The defenders on Bataan, running low on ammunition and supplies, could not hold back a final Japanese offensive. Consequently, Bataan fell on the 9th of April, with the 76,000 American and Filipino prisoners of war being subjected to a grueling 66-mile, 106 km ordeal that came to be known as the Bataan Death March. On the night of 5 to the 6th of May 1942, after an intensive aerial and artillery bombardment of Corregidor, the Japanese landed on the island, and General Wainwright surrendered on the 6th of May 1942. In the southern Philippines, where key forts and airfields had already been seized by the Japanese, the remaining American Filipino forces surrendered on the 9th of May 1942. U.S. and Filipino forces resisted in the Philippines until the 9th of May 1942, when more than 80,000 soldiers were ordered to surrender. By this time, General Douglas MacArthur, who had been appointed Supreme Allied Commander Southwest Pacific, had been withdrawn to Australia. The U.S. Navy, under Admiral Chester Nimitz, had responsibility for the rest of the Pacific Ocean. This divided command had unfortunate consequences for the Commerce War, and consequently, the war itself. In late 1941, as the Japanese struck at Pearl Harbor, most of Australia's best forces were committed to the fight against Axis forces in the Mediterranean theater. Australia was ill-prepared for an attack, lacking armaments, modern fighter aircraft, heavy bombers, and aircraft carriers. 
While still calling for reinforcements from Prime Minister Winston Churchill of Britain, the Australian Prime Minister John Kurgan called for American support with a historic announcement on the 27th of December 1941. Australia had been shocked by the speedy and crushing collapse of British Malaya and the fall of Singapore in which around 15,000 Australian soldiers were captured and became prisoners of war. Curtin predicted that battle for Australia would soon follow. The Japanese established a major base in the Australian territory of New Guinea beginning with the capture of Rabaul on the 23rd of January 1942. On the 19th of February 1942, Darwin suffered a devastating air raid, the first time the Australian mainland had been attacked. Over the following 19 months, Australia was attacked from the air almost 100 times. Two battle-hardened Australian divisions were moving from the Middle East for Singapore. Churchill wanted them diverted to Burma, but Curtin insisted on a return to Australia. In early 1942 elements of the Imperial Japanese Navy proposed an invasion of Australia. The Imperial Japanese Army opposed the plan and it was rejected in favor of a policy of isolating Australia from the United States via blockade by advancing through the South Pacific. The Japanese decided upon a seaborne invasion of Port Moresby, capital of the Australian territory of Papua which would put all of northern Australia within range of Japanese bomber aircraft. President Franklin Roosevelt ordered General Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines to formulate a Pacific defense plan with Australia in March 1942. Curtin agreed to place Australian forces under the command of MacArthur, who became Supreme Commander, Southwest Pacific. MacArthur moved his headquarters to Melbourne in March 1942 and American troops began massing in Australia. Enemy naval activity reached Sydney in late May 1942, when Japanese midget submarines launched a raid on Sydney Harbour. On 8 June 1942, two Japanese submarines briefly shelled Sydney's eastern suburbs and the city of Newcastle. In early 1942, the governments of smaller powers began to push for an intergovernmental Asia-Pacific War Council, based in Washington, D.C. A council was established in London, with a subsidiary body in Washington. However, the smaller powers continued to push for an American-based body. The Pacific War Council was formed in Washington, on 1 April 1942, with President Franklin D. Roosevelt, his key advisor Harry Hopkins, and representatives from Britain, China, Australia, the Netherlands, New Zealand, and Canada. Representatives from India and the Philippines were later added. The Council never had any direct operational control, and any decisions it made were referred to the U.S.-U.K. Combined Chiefs of Staff, which was also in Washington. Allied resistance, at first symbolic, gradually began to stiffen. Australian and Dutch forces led civilians in a prolonged guerrilla campaign in Portuguese Timor. Having accomplished their objectives during the first operation phase with ease, the Japanese now turned to the second. The second operational phase was planned to expand Japan's strategic depth by adding eastern New Guinea, New Britain, the Aleutians, Midway, the Fiji Islands, Samoa, and strategic points in the Australian area. However, the Navy General Staff, the Combined Fleet, and the Imperial Army all had different strategies for the next sequence of operations. The Navy General Staff advocated an advance to the South to seize parts of Australia. However, with large numbers of troops still engaged in China combined with those stationed in Manchuria in a standoff with the Soviet Union, the Imperial Japanese Army declined to contribute the forces necessary for such an operation. This quickly led to the abandonment of the concept. The Naval General Staff still wanted to cut the sea links between Australia and the United States by capturing New Caledonia, Fiji, and Samoa. Because this required far fewer troops, on 13 March 1942, the Naval General Staff and the Army agreed to operations with the goal of capturing Fiji and Samoa. The second operational phase began well when Leh and Salamau, located in eastern New Guinea, were captured on 8 March. However, on 10 March 1942, American carrier aircraft attacked the invasion forces and inflicted considerable losses. The raid had major operational implications because it forced the Japanese to stop their advance in the South Pacific until the combined fleet provided the means to protect future operations from American carrier attack. Concurrently, the Guinea raid occurred in April 1942, where 16 bombers took off from the aircraft carrier USS Hornet, 600 miles or 970 kilometers, from Japan. The raid inflicted minimal material damage on Japanese soil but was a huge morale boost for the United States. It also had major psychological repercussions in Japan, in exposing the vulnerabilities of the Japanese homeland. 
Because the raid was mounted by a carrier task force, it consequently highlighted the dangers the Japanese home islands could face until the destruction of the American carrier forces was achieved. With only Marcus Island and a line of converted trawlers patrolling the vast waters that separate Wake Island and Kamchatka, the Japanese east coast was left open to attack. Admiral Yamamoto, now perceived that it was essential to complete the destruction of the United States Navy, which had begun at Pearl Harbor. He proposed to achieve this by attacking and occupying Midway Atoll, and objectively thought the Americans would be certain to fight for, as Midway was close enough to threaten Hawaii. During a series of meetings held from 2nd to 5th of April 1942, the Naval General Staff and representatives of the combined fleet reached a compromise. Yamamoto got his Midway operation, but only after he had threatened to resign. In return, however, Yamamoto had to agree to two demands from the Naval General Staff, both of which had implications for the Midway operation. In order to cover the offensive in the South Pacific, Yamamoto agreed to allocate one carrier division to the operation against Fort Moresby. Yamamoto also agreed to include an attack to seize strategic points in the Aleutian Islands simultaneously with the Midway operation. These were enough to remove the Japanese margin of superiority in the coming Midway attack. The attack on Fort Moresby was codenamed Mo Operation and was divided into several parts or phases. In the first, Tulagi would be occupied on the 3rd of May. The carriers would then conduct a wide sweep through the Coral Sea to find and destroy Allied naval forces, with the landings conducted to capture Fort Moresby scheduled for the 10th of May 1942. The Mo Operation featured a force of 60 ships led by two carriers, Shokaku and Zunikaku, one light carrier, Shoho, six heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, and 15 destroyers. Additionally, some 250 aircraft were assigned to the operation including 140 aboard the three carriers. However, the actual battle did not go according to plan. Although Tulagi was seized on the 3rd of May 1942, the following day, aircraft from the American carrier Yorktown struck the invasion force. The element of surprise, which had been present at Pearl Harbor, was now lost due to the success of Allied codebreakers who had discovered the attack would be against Fort Moresby. From the Allied point of view, if Port Moresby fell, the Japanese would control the seas to the north and west of Australia and could isolate the country. An Allied task force under the command of Admiral Frank Fletcher, with the carriers USS Lexington and USS Yorktown, was assembled to stop the Japanese advance. For the next two days, the American and Japanese carrier forces tried unsuccessfully to locate each other. On the 7th of May 1942, the Japanese carriers launched a full strike on a contact reported to the enemy carriers, but the report turned out to be false. The strike force found and struck only an oiler, the Neosha, and the destroyer since. The American carriers also launched a strike with incomplete reconnaissance, and instead of finding the main Japanese carrier force, they only located and sank Shoko. On the 8th of May 1942, the opposing carrier forces finally found each other and exchanged air strikes. The 69 aircraft from the two Japanese carriers succeeded in sinking the carrier Lexington and damaging Yorktown. In return the Americans damaged Shokoku. Although Zunikaku was left undamaged, aircraft and personnel losses to Zunikaku were heavy and the Japanese were unable to support a landing on Fort Moresby. As a result, the Mo operation was cancelled, and the Japanese were subsequently forced to abandon their attempts to isolate Australia. Although they managed to sink the carrier, the battle was a disaster for the Japanese. Not only was the attack on Fort Moresby halted, which constituted the first strategic Japanese setback to the war, but all three carriers that were committed to the battle would now be unavailable for the operation against Midway. The Battle of the Coral Sea was the first naval battle fought in which the ships involved never sighted each other, with attacks solely by aircraft. After Coral Sea, the Japanese had four fleet carriers operational, Soryu, Kaga, Akaji and Hiraiyu, and believed that the Americans had a maximum of two, Enterprise and Hornet. Saratoga was out of action, undergoing repair after a torpedo attack, while Yorktown had been damaged at Coral Sea and was believed by Japanese naval intelligence to have been sunk. She would, in fact, sortie for Midway after just three days of repairs to her flight deck, with civilian work crews still aboard, in time to be present for the next decisive engagement. Yorktown and put her out of action. Later in the afternoon, aircraft from the two remaining American carriers found and destroyed Hawaii. The crippled Yorktown, along with the destroyer Hammond, were sunk by the Japanese submarine I-168. With the striking power of the Kido Bukai having been destroyed, Japan's offensive power was blunted. Early on the morning of the 5th of June, with the battle lost, the Japanese cancelled the midway operation and the initiative in the Pacific was in the balance. 
Arki and Kelly noted that although the Japanese lost four carriers, losses at Midway did not radically degrade the fighting capabilities of the IJN aviation as a whole. Japanese land forces continued to advance in the Solomon Islands and New Guinea. From July 1942, a few Australian reserve battalions, many of them very young and untrained, fought a stubborn rearguard action in New Guinea, against a Japanese advance along the Dakota Track, towards Port Moresby, over the Ruggedo and Stanley Ranges. The militia, worn out and severely defeated by casualties, were relieved in late August by regular troops from the 2nd Australian Imperial Force, returning from action in the Mediterranean theater. In early September 1942 Japanese Marines attacked a strategic Royal Australian Air Force base at Milne Bay, near the eastern tip of New Guinea. They were beaten back by Allied forces, primarily Australian Army Infantry Battalions and Royal Australian Air Force squadrons, with United States Army engineers and an anti-aircraft battery in support for the first defeat of the war for Japanese forces on land. On New Guinea, the Japanese on the Kokoda Track were within sight of the lights of Fort Moresby but were ordered to retreat to the northeastern coast. Australian and U.S. forces attacked their fortified positions and after more than two months of fighting in the Bunagona area finally captured the key Japanese beachhead in early 1943. The Japanese evacuated the island and withdrew in February 1943. In the six-month war of attrition, the Japanese had lost as a result of failing to commit enough forces in sufficient time. By late 1942, Japanese headquarters had decided to make Guadalcanal their priority. Contrarily, the Americans, most notably, U.S. Navy Admiral John S. McCain Sr. hoped to use their numerical advantage at Guadalcanal to defeat large numbers of Japanese forces there and progressively drain Japanese manpower. Ultimately nearly 20,000 Japanese died on Guadalcanal compared to just over 7,000 Americans. In mainland China, the Japanese 3rd, 6th, and 40th Divisions, a grand total of around 120,000 troops, massed at Yuyang and advanced southward in three columns, attempting again to cross the Mila River to reach Changsha. In January 1942, Chinese forces scored a victory at Changsha, the first Allied success against Japan. After the Doolittle Raid, the Imperial Japanese Army conducted the Zhejiang Yangshu Campaign, with the goal of searching out the surviving American airmen, applying retribution on the Chinese who aided them, and destroying air bases. This operation started on the 15th of May 1942 with 40 infantry and 15 to 16 artillery battalions, but was repelled by Chinese forces in September. During this campaign, the Imperial Japanese Army left behind a trail of devastation and also engaged in biological warfare, spreading cholera, typhoid, plague and dysentery pathogens. Chinese estimates put the death toll at 250,000 civilians. Around 1,700 Japanese troops died, out of a total 10,000 who fell ill when Japanese biological weapons infected their own forces. On the 2nd of November 1943, Isami Yokoyama, commander of the Imperial Japanese 11th Army, deployed the 39th, 58th, 13th, 3rd, 116th and 68th divisions, a total of around 100,000 troops, to attack Chang. During the seven-week Battle of Chang, the Chinese forced Japan to fight a costly campaign of attrition. Although the Imperial Japanese Army initially successfully captured the city, the Chinese 57th Division was able to pin them down long enough for reinforcements to arrive and encircle the Japanese. The Chinese then cut Japanese supply lines, provoking a retreat in Chinese pursuit. During the battle, Japan used chemical weapons. In the aftermath of the Japanese conquest of Burma, there was widespread disorder and pro-independence agitation in eastern India and a disastrous famine in Bengal, which ultimately caused up to 3 million deaths. Wavell commander-in-chief in India was nevertheless eager to mount counterattacks into Burma, despite these factors and inadequate lines of communication. One attack was an offensive in Iraq and intended to secure Akyab Island, important for its port and airfield. This was originally intended to be an amphibious assault, but the necessary landing craft were not available. Instead, the 14th Indian Infantry Division advanced overland down the Mayu Peninsula towards Akyab. The offensive was stalled at Rathadong and Donbake, only a few miles north of Akya, by numerically inferior Japanese forces who occupied almost impregnable bunkers. Repeated assaults, from January to March 1943, failed to overcome these positions. At this point, a Japanese division moved to Rakhine from central Burma and attacked the 14th Indian Division's exposed left flank. The Japanese crossed rivers and forested mountains which the British commanders had regarded as impassable and overran several brigades. The headquarters of the 26th Indian Infantry Division took over the front, and intended to mount a riposte against the pursuing Japanese. 
However, the exhausted and demoralized troops which had inherited failed to stand firm and the division was forced to fall back to the Indian frontier in the first week in May. At this point, monsoon rains imposed a halt on the oration. Most officers accepted that the fiasco resulted from the inadequate training for jungle warfare of both British and Indian soldiers. This in turn caused poor morale, leading to several unnecessary panics, desertions and high rates of malaria infection. To offset the depressing results of the Iraqan offensive, the Allies widely publicized a long-distance raid mounted by the Chindits under Brigadier or Charles Wingate. The Chindits suffered heavy losses, 1,138 out of a force of just over 3,000, and had inflicted only minor damage to the Japanese lines of communication. However, Wingate insisted that ordinary British and Indian troops could live and fight in the jungle as easily as the Japanese. The raid also contributed to the Japanese decision to invade India during 1944. To bring a new sense of purpose to the Southeast Asian theater, in August 1943, the Allies formed a new Southeast Asia Command, SEAC, to take over strategic responsibilities for Burma and India from the India Command. In October 1943 Winston Churchill appointed Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten as its Supreme Commander. Wavell was appointed Viceroy of India and immediately took measures to address the famine in Bengal. General Claude Ochinlet became Commander-in-Chief of the Indian Army and revitalized its administration and training establishments. The British and Indian 14th Army was formed to face the Japanese in Burma. Under Lieutenant General William Slim, its training, morale and health greatly improved. The American General Joseph Stilwell, who was also Deputy Commander to Mountbatten and commanded U.S. forces in the China-Burma-India theater, directed aid to China and prepared to construct a Lido road to link India and China by land. In 1943, the Thai Phaya Army invasion headed to Islamabad in China, but were driven back by the Chinese Expeditionary Force. Midway proved to be the last great naval battle for two years. The United States used the ensuing period to turn its vast industrial potential into increased numbers of ships, planes, and trained aircraft. At the same time, Japan, lacking an adequate industrial base or technological strategy, a good aircrew training program, or adequate naval resources and commerce defense, fell further and further behind. In strategic terms the Allies began a long movement across the Pacific, seizing one island base after another. Not every Japanese stronghold had to be captured, some, like Truth, Rebel, and Formosa, were neutralized by air attack and bypass. The goal was to get close to Japan itself, then launch massive strategic air attacks, improve the submarine blockade, and finally, only if necessary, execute an invasion. The U.S. Navy did not seek out the Japanese fleet for a decisive battle, as Mahanian doctrine would suggest, and as Japan hoped the Allied advance could only be stopped by a Japanese naval attack, which oil shortages, induced by submarine attack, made impossible. In the southwestern Pacific the Allies now seized the strategic initiative for the first time during the war and in June 1943, launched Operation Cartwheel, a series of amphibious invasions to recapture the Solomon Islands and New Guinea and ultimately isolate the major Japanese forward base at Rabaul. Following the Japanese invasion of Salamau Lay in March 1942, Cartwheel began with the Salamau Lay campaign in northern New Guinea in April 1943 which was followed in June to October by the New Georgia Campaign, in which the Allies used the landings on Rendova, drive on Munda Point and Battle of Munda Point to secure a secretly constructed Japanese airfield at Munda and the rest of New Georgia Island group. Landings from September until December secured the Treasury Islands and landed Allied troops on Schwazur, Wutenville and Cape Gloucester. These landings prepared the way for Nimitz's island hopping campaign towards Japan. In November 1943, U.S. Marines sustained high casualties when they overwhelmed the 4,500-strong garrison at Farrell. This helped the Allies to improve the techniques of amphibious landings, learning from their mistakes and implementing changes such as thorough preemptive bombings and bombardment, more careful planning regarding tides and landing craft schedules, and better overall coordination. Operations on the Gilberts were followed in late January and mid-February 1944 by further, less costly, landings on the Marshall Islands. On the 22nd of November 1943 U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Republic of China Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, met in Cairo, Egypt, to discuss a strategy to defeat Japan. The meeting was also known as the Cairo Conference and concluded with the Cairo Declaration. U.S. submarines, as well as some British and Dutch vessels, operating from bases at Cavite in the Philippines, from 1941 to 1942, Fremantle and Brisbane, Australia, Pearl Harbor, Trincomalee, Ceylon, Midway, and later Guam, 
played a major role in defeating Japan, even though submarines made up a small proportion of the Allied navies, less than 2% in the case of the US Navy. Submarines strangled Japan by sinking its merchant fleet, intercepting many troop transports, and cutting off nearly all the oil imports essential to weapons production and military operations. By early 1945, Japanese oil supplies were so limited that its food was virtually stranded. The Japanese military claimed its defenses sank 468 Allied submarines during the war. In reality, only 42 American submarines were sunk in the Pacific due to hostile action, with 10 others lost in accidents or as a result of friendly fire. The Dutch lost 5 submarines due to Japanese attacker minefield, and the British lost 3. American submarines accounted for 56% of the Japanese merchantmen sunk. Mines or aircraft destroyed most of the rest. American submariners also claimed 28% of Japanese warships destroyed. Furthermore, they played important reconnaissance roles, as at the battles of the Philippine Sea, in June 1944, and Leyte Gulf, in October 1944 and, coincidentally, at midway in June 1942, when they gave accurate and timely warning of the approach of the Japanese fleet. Submarines also rescued hundreds of downed flyers, George H. W. Bush. Allied submarines did not adopt a defensive posture and wait for the enemy to attack. Within hours of the Pearl Harbor attack, in retribution against Japan, Roosevelt promulgated a new doctrine, unrestricted submarine warfare against Japan. This meant sinking any warship, commercial vessel, or passenger ship in Axis-controlled waters, without warning and without aiding survivors. At the outbreak of the war in the Pacific, the Dutch admiral in charge of the naval defense of the East Indies, Conrad Helfrich, gave instructions to wage war aggressively. His small force of submarines sank more Japanese ships in the first weeks of the war than the entire British and U.S. navies together, an exploit which earned him the nickname, Ship a Day Helfrich. While Japan had a large number of submarines, they did not make a significant impact on the war. In 1942, the Japanese fleet submarines performed well, knocking out or damaging many Allied warships. However, Imperial Japanese Navy and pre-war U.S. doctrine stipulated that only fleet battles, not air to force, commerce raiding, could win naval campaigns. So, while the U.S. had an unusually long supply line between its west coast and frontline areas, leaving it vulnerable to submarine attack, Japan used its submarines primarily for long-range reconnaissance and only occasionally attacked U.S. supply lines. The Japanese submarine offensive against Australia in 1942 and 1943 also achieved little. As the war turned against Japan, IJN submarines increasingly served to resupply strongholds which had been cut off, such as Truk and Rabaul. In addition, Japan honored its neutrality treaty with the Soviet Union and ignored American freighters shipping millions of tons of military supplies from San Francisco to Vladivostok, much to the consternation of its German ally. The U.S. Navy, by contrast, relied on commerce raiding from the outset. However, the problem of Allied forces surrounded in the Philippines, during the early part of 1942, led to diversion of boats to guerrilla submarine missions. Basing in Australia placed boats under Japanese aerial threat while en route to patrol areas, reducing their effectiveness, and Nimitz relied on submarines for close surveillance of enemy bases. Furthermore, the standard-issue Mark 14 torpedo and its Mark 6 exploder both proved defective, problems which were not corrected until September 1943. Worst of all, before the war, an uninformed U.S. customs officer had seized a copy of the Japanese Merchant Marine Code, called the Maru Code, in the USN not knowing that the Office of Naval Intelligence only had broken it. 149, the Japanese promptly changed it, and the new code was not broken again by OP-20G until 1943. Thus, only in 1944 did the U.S. Navy begin to use its 150 submarines to maximum effect, installing effective shipboard radar, replacing commanders deemed lacking in aggression, and fixing the faults in the torpedoes. Japanese commerce protection was shipless beyond description, and convoys were poorly organized and defended compared to Allied ones, a product of flaws, IJN doctrine and training, errors concealed by American faults as much as Japanese overconfidence. The number of American submarines patrols, and sinkings rose steeply, 350 patrols, 180 ships sunk, in 1942, 350 or 335, in 1943, and 520 or 603, in 1944. By 1945, sinkings of Japanese vessels had decreased because so few targets dared to venture out on the high seas. In all, Allied submarines destroyed 1,200 merchant ships, 
about 5 million tons of shipping. Most were small cargo carriers, but 124 were tankers bringing desperately needed oil from the East Indies. Another 320 were passenger ships and troop transports. At critical stages of the Guadalcanal, Saipan, and Leyte campaigns, thousands of Japanese troops were killed or diverted from where they were needed. Over 200 warships were sunk, ranging from many auxiliaries and destroyers to one battleship and no fewer than eight carriers. Underwater warfare was especially dangerous, of the 16,000 Americans who went out on patrol, 3,500, 22% never returned, the highest casualty rate of any American force in World War II. The Joint Army-Navy Assessment Committee assessed U.S. submarine credits. The Japanese losses, 130 submarines in all, were higher. In mid-1944 Japan mobilized over 500,000 men and launched a massive operation across China under the code name Operation Uchido, their largest offensive of World War II, with the goal of connecting Japanese-controlled territory in China and French Indochina and capturing airbases in southeastern China where American bombers were based. During this time, about 250,000 newly American-trained Chinese troops under Joseph Stilwell and Chinese Expeditionary Force were forcibly locked in the Burmese theater by the terms of the Lend-Lease Agreement. Though Japan suffered about 100,000 casualties, these attacks, the biggest in several years, gained much ground for Japan before Chinese forces stopped the incursions in Guangxi. Despite major tactical victories, the operation overall failed to provide Japan with any significant strategic gains. A great majority of the Chinese forces were able to retreat out of the area, and later come back to attack Japanese positions at the Battle of West Hunan. Japan was not any closer to defeating China after this operation, and the constant defeats the Japanese suffered in the Pacific meant that Japan never got the time and resources needed to achieve final victory over China. Operation Ichigo created a great sense of social confusion in the areas of China that it affected. Chinese communist guerrillas were able to exploit this confusion to gain influence and control of greater areas of the countryside in the aftermath of Ichigo. After the Allied setbacks in 1943, the Southeast Asia Command prepared to launch offensives into Burma on several fronts. In the first months of 1944, the Chinese and American troops of the Northern Combat Area Command NCAC, commanded by the American Joseph Stilwell, began extending the Lado Road from India into northern Burma, while the Indian 15th Corps began an advance along the coast in Iraq and province. In February 1944 the Japanese mounted a local counterattack in Iraq. After early Japanese success, this counterattack was defeated in the Battle of the Admin Box when the Indian divisions of 15th Corps stood firm, relying on aircraft to drop supplies to isolated forward units and full reserve divisions to relieve them. The Japanese launched a long-planned offensive of their own into India in the middle of March, across the mountainous and densely forested frontier. This attack, codenamed Operation Yugo, was advocated by Lt. Gen. Renya Mutaguchi, the recently promoted commander of the Japanese 15th Army. Imperial General Headquarters endorsed the plan, despite misgivings by Mutaguchi's subordinates and staffs of Japanese Burma Area Army and Southern Expeditionary Army Group. Lt. Gen. Slim, Commanding the British 14th Army and his forward commander, Lt. Gen. Joffrey Schoon, planned to withdraw into the Imphal Plain in Manipur State and force the Japanese to fight with their communications stretching over scores of miles of jungle trails. However, they were slow to respond when the attack was launched and did not foresee some Japanese objectives. Some British and Indian units had to fight their way out of encirclement, but by early April they had concentrated around Imphal. Several units were flown from the Arakan to reinforce them. A Japanese division which had advanced to Kohima in Nagaland cut the main road to Imphal, but failed to capture the whole of the defenses at Kohima. During April, the Japanese attacks against Imphal failed, while fresh Allied formations drove the Japanese from the positions they had captured at Kohima. As many Japanese had feared, their inadequate lines of communication and the failure of Mutaguchi's gamble on an early victory to allow them to capture Allied supplies meant that their troops, particularly those at Kohima, starved. Once the monsoon rains descended in the middle of May, they also succumbed to disease in large numbers. During May, while Mutaguchi continued to order attacks, the Allies advanced southwards from Kohima and northwards from Imphal. The two Allied attacks met on the 22nd of June, breaking the Japanese siege of Imphal. The Japanese finally broke off the operation on the 3rd of July. They had lost over 50,000 troops, mainly to starvation and disease. This represented the worst defeat suffered by the Imperial Japanese Army to that date. 
Although the advance in Iraq had been halted to release troops and aircraft for the Battle of Info, the Americans and Chinese had continued to advance in northern Burma, aided by the reinforced Shindits operating against the Japanese lines of communication. In the middle of 1944, the Chinese Expeditionary Force invaded northern Burma from Yunnan. They captured a fortified position at Mount Song. By the time campaigning ceased during the monsoon, the Northern Combat Area Command had secured a vital airfield at Mayatina after a prolonged siege which ended in early August. Possession of this airfield eased the problems of air resupply from India to China over the hump. In May 1943, the Japanese prepared Operation Z, or the Z Plan, which envisioned the use of Japanese naval power to counter American forces threatening the outer defense perimeter line. This line extended from the Aleutians down through Wake, the Marshall and Gilbert Islands, Nauru, the Bismarck Archipelago, New Guinea, then westward past Java and Sumatra to Burma. In 1943-44, Allied forces in the Solomons began driving relentlessly to Rabaul, eventually encircling and neutralizing the stronghold. With their position in the Solomons disintegrating, the Japanese modified the Z-Plan by eliminating the Gilbert and Marshall Islands, and the Bismarck Archipelago as vital areas to be defended. They then based their possible actions on the defense of an inner perimeter, which included the Marianas, Palau, Western New Guinea, and the Dutch East Indies. Meanwhile, in the Central Pacific the Americans initiated a major offensive, beginning in November 1943 with landings in the Gilbert Islands. The Japanese were forced to watch helplessly as their garrisons in the Gilberts and then the Marshalls were crushed. The strategy of holding overextended island garrisons was fully exposed. In February 1944, the U.S. Navy's Fast Carrier Task Force, during Operation Hailstone, attacked the major naval base of Truk. Although the Japanese had moved their major vessels out in time to avoid being caught at anchor in the atoll, two days of air attacks resulted in significant losses to Japanese aircraft and merchant shipping. The Japanese were forced to abandon Truk and were now unable to counter the Americans on any front on the perimeter. Consequently, the Japanese retained their remaining strength in preparation for what they hoped would be a decisive battle. The Japanese then developed a new plan, known as AGO. AGO envisioned a decisive fleet action that would be fought somewhere from the Palau's to the Western Carolines. It was in this area that the newly formed mobile fleet along with large numbers of land-based aircraft would be concentrated. If the Americans attacked the Marianas, they would be attacked by land-based planes in the vicinity. Then the Americans would be lured into the areas where the mobile fleet could defeat them. The islands of Saipan and Tinian were used extensively by the United States military as they finally put mainland Japan within round-trip range of American B-29 bombers. In response, Japanese forces attacked the bases on Saipan and Tinian from November 1944 to January 1945. At the same time and afterwards, the United States Army Air Forces based out of these islands conducted an intense strategic bombing campaign against the Japanese cities of military and industrial importance, including Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, Kobe and others. The invasion of Peleliu in the Palau Islands on the 15th of September was notable for a drastic change in Japanese defensive tactics, resulting in the highest casualty rate amongst U.S. forces in an amphibious operation during the Pacific War. Instead of the predicted four days, it took until the 27th of November 1944 to secure the island. The ultimate strategic value of the landings is still contested. When the Americans landed on Saipan in the Marianas the Japanese viewed holding Saipan as an imperative. Consequently, the Japanese responded with their largest carrier force of the war, the nine-carrier mobile fleet under the command of Vice Admiral Jizaburo Ozawa, supplemented by an additional 500 land-based aircraft. Facing them was the U.S. 5th Fleet under the command of Admiral Raymond A. Spruance, which contained 15 fleet carriers and 956 aircraft. The clash was the largest carrier battle in history. The battle did not turn out as the Japanese had hoped. During the previous month, U.S. destroyers had destroyed 17 out of 25 submarines in Ozawa's screening force and repeated American air raids destroyed the Japanese land-based aircraft. On the 19th of June, a series of Japanese carrier airstrikes were shattered by strong American defenses. The result was later dubbed the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. All U.S. carriers had combat information centers, which interpreted the flow of radar data and radio interception orders to the combat air patrols. The few Japanese attackers that managed to reach the U.S. fleet in a staggered sequence encountered massive anti-aircraft fire with proximity fuel. Only one American warship was slightly damaged. On the same day, Shokuku was hit by four torpedoes from the submarine Kavala and sank with heavy loss of life. 
The tanker was also sunk by a single torpedo from the submarine altitude. The next day, the Japanese carrier force was subjected to an American carrier air attack and suffered the loss of the carrier Hayat. The four Japanese air strikes involved 373 carrier aircraft, of which 130 returned to the carriers. Many of these survivors were subsequently lost when Tango and Shokoku were sunk by American submarine attacks. After the second day of the battle, losses totaled three carriers and 445 aircrew with more than 433 carrier aircraft and around 200 land-based aircraft. The Americans lost 130 aircraft and 76 aircrew, many losses due to aircraft running out of fuel returning to their carriers at night. Although the defeat at the Philippine Sea was severe in terms of the loss of the three fleet carriers Tejo, Shokoku and the Haya, the real disaster was the annihilation of the carrier air groups. These losses to the already outnumbered Japanese fleet air arm were irreplaceable. The Japanese had spent the better part of a year reconstituting their carrier air groups, and the Americans had destroyed 90% of it in two days. The Japanese had only enough pilots left to form the air group for one of their light carriers. The mobile fleet returned home with only 35 aircraft of the 430 with which it had begun the battle. The battle ended in a total Japanese defeat and resulted in the virtual end of their carrier force. The disaster at the Philippine Sea left the Japanese with two choices, either to commit their remaining strength in an all-out offensive or to sit by while the Americans occupied the Philippines and cut the sea lanes between Japan and the vital resources from the Dutch East Indies and Malaya. Thus the Japanese devised a plan which represented a final attempt to force a decisive battle by utilizing their last remaining strength, the firepower of its heavy cruisers and battleships, against the American beachhead at Leyte. The Japanese plan to use their remaining carriers as bait in order to lure the American carriers away from Leyte Gulf long enough for the heavy warships to enter and to destroy any American ships present. The Japanese assembled a force totaling four carriers, nine battleships, 14 heavy cruisers, seven light cruisers, and 35 destroyers. They split into three forces. The center force, under the command of Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita, consisted of five battleships including the Yamato and Musashi, 12 cruisers and 13 destroyers. The northern force, under the command of Jutaburo Ozawa, comprised four carriers, two battleships partly converted to carriers, three light cruisers and nine destroyers. The southern force, contained two groups, one under the command of Shoji Nishimura consisting of two Fuso-class battleships, one heavy cruiser and four destroyers, the other under Kiyohide Shima comprised two heavy cruisers, a light cruiser and four destroyers. The main center force would pass through the San Bernardino Strait into the Philippine Sea, turn southwards, and then attack the landing area. The two separate groups of the southern force would join up and strike at the landing area through the Surigao Strait, while the northern force with the Japanese carriers would lure the main American covering forces away from Leyte. The carriers embarked a total of just 108 aircraft. However, after center force departed from Brunei Bay on the 23rd of October 1944, two American submarines attacked it, resulting in the loss of two heavy cruisers with another cripple. After entering the Sea Union Sea on the 24th of October 1944, Center Force was assaulted by American carrier aircraft throughout the whole day, forcing another heavy cruiser to retire. The Americans then targeted the Musashi and sank it under a barrage of torpedo and bomb hits. Many other ships of Center Force were attacked, but continued on. Convinced that their attacks had made Center Force ineffective, the American carriers headed north to address the newly detected threat of the Japanese carriers of Ozawa's northern force. On the night of 24th to 25th of October 1944, the southern force under Nishimura attempted to enter Leyte Gulf from the south through Surigao Strait, where an American-Australian force led by Rear Admiral Jesse Oldendorf and consisting of six battleships, eight cruisers, and 26 destroyers, ambushed the Japanese. Utilizing radar-guided torpedo attacks, American destroyers sank one of the battleships and three destroyers while damaging the other battleships. Radar-guided naval gunfire then finished off the second battleship, with only a single Japanese destroyer surviving. As a result of observing radio silence, Shima's group was unable to coordinate and synchronize its movements with Nishimura's group and subsequently arrived at Surigao Strait. In the middle of the encounter, after making a haphazard torpedo attack, Shima retreated. Off Cape Anganya, 500 miles or 800 kilometers north of Leyte Gulf, the Americans launched over 500 aircraft sorties at the northern force, followed up by a surface group of cruisers and destroyers. All four Japanese carriers were sunk, but this part of the Japanese plan had succeeded in drawing the American carriers away from Leyte Gulf. On the 25th of October 1944, 
The final major surface action fought between the Japanese and the American fleets during the war occurred off Samoa, when center force fell upon a group of American escort carriers escorted only by destroyers and destroyer escorts. Both sides were surprised, but the outcome looked certain since the Japanese had four battleships, six heavy cruisers, and two light cruisers leading two destroyer squadrons. However, they did not press home their advantage, and were content to conduct a largely indecisive gunnery duel before breaking off. Japanese losses were extremely heavy, with four carriers, three battleships, six heavy cruisers, four light cruisers and eleven destroyers sunk, while the Americans lost one light carrier and two escort carriers, a destroyer and two destroyer escorts. The Battle of Leyte Gulf was the largest naval battle of World War II and arguably the largest naval battle in history. For the Japanese the defeat at Leyte Gulf was catastrophic. The Imperial Japanese Navy had suffered its greatest ever loss of ships and men in combat. The inevitable liberation of the Philippines also meant that the home islands would be virtually cut off from the vital resources from Japan's occupied territories in Southeast Asia. On the 20th of October 1944, the U.S. 6th Army, supported by naval and air bombardment, landed on the favorable eastern shore of Leyte, north of Mindanao. The U.S. 6th Army continued its advance from the east, while the Japanese rushed reinforcements to the Ormoc Bay area on the western side of the island. The U.S. reinforced the 6th Army successfully, but the U.S. 5th Air Force devastated Japanese attempts to resupply. In torrential rains and over difficult terrain, the U.S. advance continued across Leyte and the neighboring island of Samar to the north. On 7 December 1944, U.S. Army units landed at Ormoc Bay and, after a major land and air battle, cut off the Japanese ability to reinforce and supply Leyte. Although fierce fighting continued on Leyte for months, the U.S. Army was in control. On 15 December 1944, landings against minimal resistance took place on the southern beaches of the island of Mindoro, a key location in the planned Lingayan Gulf operation, in support of major landings scheduled on Mindoro. On 9 January 1945 General Kruger's 6th Army landed its first units on the south shore of Lingayan Gulf on the western coast of Mindoro. Almost 175,000 men followed across the 20 mile, 32 kilometers beachhead within a few days. With heavy air support, Army units pushed inland, taking Clark Field, 40 miles, 64 kilometers, northwest of Manila, in the last week of January. Two more major landings followed, one to cut off the Bataan Peninsula, and another, that included a parachute drop, south of Manila. Pincers closed on the city, and on the 3rd of February 1945, elements of the 1st Cavalry Division pushed into the northern outskirts of Manila and the 8th Cavalry passed through the northern suburbs and into the city itself. The month-long battle for Manila resulted in over 100,000 civilian deaths and was the scene of the worst urban fighting fought by American forces in the Pacific Theater. As the advance on Manila continued from the north and the south, the Bataan Peninsula was rapidly secured. On 16 February paratroopers and amphibious units assaulted the island fortress of Corregidor, and resistance ended there on 27 February 1945. In all, 10 U.S. divisions and 5 independent regiments battled on Luzon, making it the largest campaign of the Pacific War, involving more troops than the United States had used in North Africa, Italy, or Southern France. Forces included the Mexican Esquadron 201 Fighter Squadron as part of the Fuerza Aérea Expeditionaria Mexicana FAEM, Mexican Expeditionary Air Force, with the squadron attached to the 58th Fighter Group of the United States Army Air Forces that flew tactical support missions. Of the 250,000 Japanese troops defending Luzon, 80% died. The last remaining Japanese soldier in the Philippines, Hiro Onoda, surrendered on the 9th of March 1974. The 8th Army invaded Palawan Island, between Borneo and Mindoro, the fifth largest and westernmost Philippine island, on the 28th of February 1945, with landings at Puerto Princesa. The Japanese put up little direct defense of Palawan, but cleaning up pockets of Japanese resistance lasted until late April, as the Japanese used their common tactic of withdrawing into the mountain jungles, dispersed as small units. Throughout the Philippines, Filipino guerrillas aided U.S. forces to find and dispatch the holdouts. The U.S. 8th Army then moved on to its first landing on Mindanao, the 17th of April 1945, the last of the major Philippine islands to be taken. Then followed the invasion and occupation of Panay, Cebu, Negros and several islands in the Sulu archipelago. These islands provided bases for the U.S. 5th and 13th Air Forces to attack targets throughout the Philippines and the South China Sea. 
In late 1944 and early 1945, the Allied Southeast Asia Command launched offensives into Burma, intending to recover most of the country, including Rangoon, the capital, before the onset of the monsoon in May. The offensives were fought primarily by British Commonwealth, Chinese and United States forces against the forces of Imperial Japan, who were assisted to some degree by Thailand, the Burma National Army and the Indian National Army. The British Commonwealth land forces were drawn primarily from the United Kingdom, British India and Africa. The Indian 15th Corps advanced along the coast in Iraq and province, at last capturing Akyab Island after failures in the two previous years. They then landed troops behind the retreating Japanese, inflicting heavy casualties, and captured Ramri Island and Chibula Island off the coast, establishing airfields on them which were used to support the offensive into central Burma. The Chinese Expeditionary Force captured Mongu and Lashia, while the Chinese and American Northern Combat Area Command resumed its advance in northern Burma. In late January 1945, these two forces linked up with each other at Shipong. The Lado Road was completed, linking India and China, but too late in the war to have any significant effect. The Japanese Burma Area Army attempted to forestall the main Allied attack on the central part of the front by withdrawing their troops behind the Irrawaddy River. Lieutenant General Haidaro Kimura, the new Japanese commander in Burma, hoped that the Allied lines of communication would be overstretched trying to cross this obstacle. However, the advancing British 14th Army under Lieutenant General William Slim switched its axis of advance to outflank the main Japanese armies. During February, the 14th Army secured bridgeheads across the Irrawaddy on a broad front. On the 1st of March 1945, units of 4th Corps captured the supply center of Maiktaila, throwing the Japanese into disarray. While the Japanese attempted to recapture Maiktaila, 33rd Corps captured Mandalay. The Japanese armies were heavily defeated, and with the capture of Mandalay, the Burmese population and the Burma National Army, which the Japanese had raised, turned against the Japanese. During April 1945, 14th Army advanced 300 miles, 480 kilometers, south towards Rangoon, the capital and principal port of Burma, but was delayed by Japanese rearguards 40 miles, 64 kilometers, north of Rangoon at the end of the month. Slim feared that the Japanese would defend Rangoon house to house during the monsoon, which would commit his army to prolonged action with disastrously inadequate supplies, and in March he had asked that a plan to capture Rangoon by an amphibious force, Operation Dracula, which had been abandoned earlier, be reinstated. Dracula was launched on the 1st of May, to find that the Japanese had already evacuated Rangoon. The troops that occupied Rangoon linked up with 14th Army five days later, securing the Allies' lines of communication. The Japanese forces which had been bypassed by the Allied advances attempted to break out across the Sidong River during June and July to rejoin the Burma Area Army which had regrouped in Tenasserim in southern Burma. They suffered 14,000 casualties, half their strength. Overall, the Japanese lost some 150,000 men in Burma. Only 1,700 Japanese soldiers surrendered and were taken prisoner. The Allies were preparing to make amphibious landings in Malaya when word of the Japanese surrender arrived. Although the Marianas were secure and American bases firmly established, the long 1,200 miles or 1,900 kilometers range from the Marianas meant that B-29 aircrews on bombing missions over Japan found themselves ditching in the sea if they suffered severe damage and were unable to return home. Attention focused on the island of Iwo Jima in the Volcano Islands, about halfway between the Marianas and Japan. American planners recognized the strategic importance of the island, which was only 5 miles or 8.0 kilometers long, 8 square miles or 21 square kilometers in area and had no native population. The island was used by the Japanese as an early warning station against impending air raids on Japanese cities. Additionally, Japanese aircraft based on Iwo Jima were able to attack the B-29s on their bombing missions on each of their missions and on the returning leg home, and even to attack installations in the Marianas themselves. The capture of Iwo Jima would provide emergency landing airfields to repair and refuel crippled B-29s and trouble on their way home in a base for P-51 fighter escorts for the B-29s. Iwo Jima could also provide a base from which land-based air support could protect the U.S. naval troops as they moved into Japanese waters along the arc descending from Tokyo through the Yuku Islands. However, the Japanese had also come to realize the strategic value of Iwo Jima, and Lieutenant General Tatamiki Kuribayashi was assigned command of the island in May 1944. In the months following, the Japanese began work constructing elaborate defenses, making the best possible use of the island's natural caves and the uneven, rocky terrain. The island was transformed into a massive network of bunkers, 
Rocket and Gun, with underground passageways leading from one strong point to another. Natural caves were enlarged, and many new ones were blasted out. A total of 11 miles 18 kilometers s of tunnels were constructed. The Japanese also went to great lengths to construct large underground chambers, some as much as five-story feet to serve as storage and hospital areas with thick walls and ceilings made of reinforced concrete. The main underground command post had a concrete roof 10 feet, 3.0 meters thick. Pillboxes, bunkers and other defensive works were built close to the ground. A series of strong points covering the landing areas were also built, most were covered with sand and then carefully camouflaged. The many well camouflaged 120 mm and 6 inch guns were in place so that their fire could be directed to the beaches. The pillboxes and bunkers were all connected so that if one was knocked out, it could be reoccupied again. Smaller caliber artillery, anti aircraft guns, and mortars were also well hidden and located where only a direct hit could destroy them. The Japanese were determined to make the Americans pay a high price for Iwo Jima and were prepared to defend it to the death. Kuribayashi knew that he could not win the battle but hoped to inflict severe casualties so costly that it would slow the American advance on Japan and maybe give the Japanese some bargaining power. In February 1944, a total of 21,000 Japanese troops were deployed on Iwo Jima. The American operation, Operation Detachment, to capture the island involved three marine divisions of the 5th Amphibious Corps, a total of 70,647 troops, under the command of Holland Smith. From mid-June 1944, Iwo Jima came under American air and naval bombardment, this continued until the days leading up to the invasion. An intense naval and air bombardment preceded the landing but did little but drive the Japanese further underground, making their positions impervious to enemy fire. The hidden guns and defenses survived the constant bombardment virtually unscathed. On the morning of the 19th of February 1945, 30,000 men of 4th and 5th Marine Divisions under the command of Major. General Harry Schmidt landed on the southeast coast of the island near MT. Suribachi, an inactive volcano, where most of the island's defenses were concentrated. The Japanese held fire until the landing beaches were full. As soon as the Marines pushed inland they came under devastating machine gun and artillery fire. Although they managed to gain a foothold on the beaches, the defenders made them pay a high price for every advance inland. By the end of the day, the Marines reached the west coast of the island, but their losses were severe. Almost 2,000 men killed or wounded. On the 23rd of February, the 28th Marine Regiment reached the summit of MT. Suribachi, prompting the now famous raising the flag on Iwo Jima photograph. Navy Secretary James Forrester, upon seeing the flag, remarked, there will be a Marine Corps for the next 500 years. The flag raising is often cited as the most reproduced photograph of all time and became the archetypal representation not only of that battle, but of the entire Pacific War. For the rest of February, the Americans pushed north, and by the 1st of March, had taken two-thirds of the island. But it was not until the 26th of March that the island was finally secured. Iwo Jima was one of the bloodiest battles fought by the Americans during the Pacific War, the Japanese fought to the last man. American casualties were 6,821 killed and 19,207 wounded. The Japanese losses totaled well over 20,000 men killed, with only 1,083 prisoners taken. Historians debate whether it was strategically worth the casualties sustained. The battle for Okinawa proved costly and lasted much longer than the Americans had originally expected. The Japanese had skillfully utilized terrain to inflict maximum casualties. Total American casualties were 49,451, including 12,520 dead or missing and 36,631 wounded. Japanese casualties were approximately 110,000 killed, and 7,400 were taken prisoner. 94% of the Japanese soldiers died along with many civilians. Kamikaze attacks also sank 36 ships of all types, damaged 368 more and led to the deaths of 4,900 U.S. sailors, for the loss of 7,800 Japanese aircraft. By April 1945, China had already been at war with Japan for more than seven years. Both nations were exhausted by years of battles, bombings and blockades. After Japanese victories in Operation Ichigo, Japan was losing the battle in Burma and facing constant attacks from Chinese nationalist forces and communist guerrillas in the countryside. The Imperial Japanese Army began preparations for the Battle of West Kuna in March 1945. The Japanese mobilized 34, 47, 64, 68 and 116th Divisions, 
as well as the 86th Independent Brigade, for a total of 80,000 men to seize Chinese airfields and secure railroads in West Hunan by early April. In response, the Chinese National Military Council dispatched the 4th Front Army and the 10th and 27th Army Groups with the Yingchen as Commander-in-Chief. At the same time, it airlifted the entire Chinese Mu-6 Corps, an American-equipped foreign veteran of the Burma Expeditionary Force, from Kunming to Zhejiang. Chinese forces totaled 110,000 men in 20 divisions. They were supported by about 400 aircraft from Chinese and American air forces. Chinese forces achieved a decisive victory and launched a large counterattack in this campaign. Concurrently, the Chinese managed to repel a Japanese offensive in Henan and Hubei. Afterwards, Chinese forces retook Hunan and Hubei provinces in South China. Chinese launched a counter-offensive to retake Guangxi which was the last major Japanese stronghold in South China. In August 1945, Chinese forces successfully retook Guangxi. The Borneo Campaign of 1945 was the last major campaign in the Southwest Pacific area. In a series of amphibious assaults between the 1st of May and the 21st of July 1945, the Australian First Corps, under General Leslie Morshead, attacked Japanese forces occupying the island. Allied naval and air forces, centered on the U.S. 7th Fleet under Admiral Thomas Kincaid, the Australian 1st Tactical Air Force and the U.S. 13th Air Force also played important roles in the campaign. The campaign opened with a landing on the small island of Tarakan on the 1st of May. This was followed on the 1st of June by simultaneous assaults in the northwest, on the island of Laguan and the coast of Brunei. A week later the Australians attacked Japanese positions in North Borneo. The attention of the Allies then switched back to the central east coast, with the last major amphibious assault of World War II at Balikopan on the 1st of July. Although the campaign was criticized in Australia at the time, and in subsequent years, as pointless or a waste of the lives of soldiers, it did achieve a number of objectives, such as increasing the isolation of significant Japanese forces occupying the main part of the Dutch East Indies, capturing major oil supplies and freeing Allied prisoners of war, who were being held in deteriorating conditions. At one of the very worst sites, around Sandakan in Borneo, only six of some 2,500 British and Australian prisoners survived. Hard-fought battles on the Japanese islands of Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and others resulted in horrific casualties on both sides but finally produced a Japanese defeat. Of the 117,000 Okinawan and Japanese troops defending Okinawa, 94% died. Faced with the loss of most of their experienced pilots, the Japanese increased their use of kamikaze tactics in an attempt to create unacceptably high casualties for the Allies. The U.S. Navy proposed to force a Japanese surrender through a total naval blockade and air raids. Many military historians believe that the Okinawa campaign led directly to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as a means of avoiding the planned ground invasion of the Japanese mainland. This view was explained by Victor Davis Hansen. Towards the end of the war as the role of strategic bombing became more important, a new command for the United States Strategic Air Forces in the Pacific was created to oversee all U.S. strategic bombing in the hemisphere under United States Army Air Forces General Curtis LeMay. Japanese industrial production plunged as nearly half of the build-up areas of 67 cities were destroyed by B-29 firebombing raids. On 9th to 10th of March 1945, General Curtis LeMay oversaw Operation Meeting House which saw 300 Boeing B-29 Superfortress bombers drop 1,665 tons of bombs, mostly 500-pound E-46 napalm-carrying M-69 incendiary bombs on the Japanese capital. This attack has seen the most destructive bombing raid in history and killed between 80,000 and 100,000 people in a single night as well as destroying over 270,000 buildings and leaving over 1 million residents homeless. In the 10 days that followed, almost 10,000 bombs were dropped destroying 31% of Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka and Kobe. LeMay also oversaw Operation Starvation, in which the inland waterways of Japan were extensively mined by air, which disrupted a small amount of remaining Japanese coastal sea traffic. On the 26th of July 1945, the President of the United States Harry S. Truman, the Chairman of the Nationalist Government of China Chiang Kai-shek and the Prime Minister of Great Britain Winston Churchill issued the Potsdam Declaration, which outlined the terms of surrender for the Empire of Japan as agreed upon at the Potsdam Conference. This ultimatum stated that, if Japan did not surrender, it would face, prompt and utter destruction. On the 6th of August 1945, the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima in the first nuclear attack in history. In a press release issued after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, President Harry S. 
truly warned Japan to surrender, expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. Three days later, on the 9th of August, the U.S. dropped another atomic bomb on Nagasaki, the last nuclear attack in history. More than 140,000 minus 240,000 people died as a direct result of these two bombings. The necessity of the atomic bombings had long been debated, with detractors claiming that a naval blockade and incendiary bombing campaign had already made invasion, hence the atomic bomb, unnecessary. However, other scholars have argued that the atomic bombing shocked the Japanese government into surrender, with the emperor finally indicating his wish to stop the war. Another argument in favor of the atomic bombs is that they helped avoid Operation Downfall, or a prolonged blockade and conventional bombing campaign, any of which would have exacted much higher casualties among Japanese civilians. In February 1945, during the Yalta Conference the Soviet Union had agreed to enter the war against Japan 90 days after the surrender of Germany. At the time Soviet participation was seen as crucial to tie down the large number of Japanese forces in Manchuria and Korea, keeping them from being transferred to the home islands to mount a defense to an invasion. On the 9th of August, exactly on schedule, 90 days after the war ended in Europe, the Soviet Union entered the war by invading Manchuria. A battle-hardened, one million strong Soviet force, transferred from Europe, attacked Japanese forces in Manchuria and landed a heavy blow against the Japanese Kantogen, Kwantung Army. The Manchurian strategic offensive operation began on the 9th of August 1945, with the Soviet invasion of the Japanese puppet state of Manchukuo and with the last campaign of the Second World War and the largest of the 1945 Soviet-Japanese War which resumed hostilities between the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and the Empire of Japan after almost six years of peace. Soviet gains on the continent were Manchukuo, Mengjong Inner Mongolia, and Northern Korea. The USSR's entry into the war was a significant factor in the Japanese decision to surrender as it became apparent the Soviet Union were no longer willing to act as an intermediary for a negotiated settlement on favorable terms. In late 1945, the Soviets also launched a series of successful invasions of northern Japanese territories, in preparation for the possible invasion of Hokkaido. The effects of the American air and naval attacks, atomic bombings, and the Soviet entry were profound. On the 10th of August, the sacred decision was made by Japanese cabinet to accept the Potsdam terms on one condition, the prerogative of His Majesty as a sovereign ruler. At noon on the 15th of August, after the American government's intentionally ambiguous reply, stating that the authority of the emperor shall be subject to the supreme commander of the Allied powers, the emperor broadcast to the nation and to the world at large the rescript of surrender, ending the Second World War. Should he continue to fight, it would not only result in an ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but also it would lead to the total extinction of human civilization. Emperor Hirohito, the imperial respite was the 15th of August 1945. In Japan, the 14th of August 1945, is considered to be the day that the Pacific War ended. However, as Imperial Japan actually surrendered on the 15th of August 1945, this day became known in the English-speaking countries as Victory in Japan. The formal Japanese instrument of surrender was signed on the 2nd of September 1945, on the battleship USS Missouri, in Tokyo Bay. The surrender was accepted by General Douglas MacArthur as Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers, with representatives of several Allied nations, from a Japanese delegation led by Mamoru Shigemitsu and Yoshihiro Yumazu. Following this period, MacArthur went to Tokyo to oversee the post-war development of the country. This period in Japanese history is known as the occupation. In Allied countries during the war, the Pacific War was not usually distinguished from World War II in general, or was known simply as the war against Japan. In the United States, the term Pacific Theater was widely used, although this was a misnomer in relation to the Allied campaign in Burma, the war in China and other activities within the Southeast Asian theater. However, the U.S. armed forces considered the China-Burma-India theater to be distinct from the Asiatic Pacific Theater during the conflict. Japan used the name Greater East Asia War, as chosen by a cabinet decision on 10 December 1941, to refer to both the war with the Western Allies and the ongoing war in China. This name was released to the public on 12 December, with an explanation that it involved Asian nations achieving their independence from the Western powers through armed forces of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Japanese officials integrated what they called the Japan-China Incident into the Greater East Asia War. During the Allied military occupation of Japan, 1945-1952, these Japanese terms were prohibited in official documents, 
Although their informal usage continued, and the war became officially known as the Pacific War, Taihaiyo Sensa. In Japan, the 15 years war, Jugonin Sensa, is also used, referring to the period from the Mutan incident of 1931 through 1945. Moreover, Japan conscripted many soldiers from its colonies of Korea and Taiwan. Liberationist security units were also formed in Hong Kong, reformed ex colonial police syndicate. The Philippines also a member of the Greater East Asia Co Prosperity Sphere, the Dutch East Indies, the Phoenix British Malaya, British Borneo, former French Indochina after the overthrow of the French regime in 1945. The Vichy French had previously allowed the Japanese to move bases in French Indochina beginning in 1941, following an invasion as well as Timorese militia. These units assisted the Japanese war effort in their respective territories. Germany and Italy both had limited involvement in the Pacific War. The German and the Italian navies operated submarines and raiding ships in the Indian and Pacific Ocean, notably the Monson Brook. The Italians had access to concession territory naval bases in China which they utilized, and which was later ceded to collaborationist China by the Italian Social Republic in late 1943. After Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor and the subsequent declarations of war, both navies had access to Japanese naval facilities. Between 1942 and 1945, there were four main areas of conflict in the Pacific War, China, the Central Pacific, Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific. U.S. sources refer to two theaters within the Pacific War, the Pacific Theater and the China-Burma-India Theater CBI. However these were not operational commands. In the Pacific, the Allies divided operational control of their forces between two supreme commands, known as Pacific Ocean Areas and Southwest Pacific Area. In 1945, for a brief period just before the Japanese surrender, the Soviet Union and Mongolia engaged Japanese forces in Manchuria and Northeast China. The Imperial Japanese Navy did not integrate its units into permanent theater command. The Imperial Japanese Army, which had already created the Kwantung Army to oversee its occupation of Manchukuo and the China Expeditionary Army during the Second Sino-Japanese War, created the Southern Expeditionary Army Group at the outset of its conquests of Southeast Asia. This headquarters controlled the bulk of the Japanese Army formations which opposed the Western Allies in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. The war culminated in massive Allied air raids over Japan, and the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, accompanied by the Soviet Union's declaration of war and invasion, of Manchuria, and other territories on the 9th of August 1945, causing the Japanese to announce an intent to surrender. The formal surrender of Japan ceremony took place aboard the battleship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay on the 2nd of September 1945. After the war, Japan lost all rights and titles to its former possessions in Asia and the Pacific, and its sovereignty was limited to the four main home islands and other minor islands as determined by the Allies. Japan's Shinto Emperor relinquished much of his authority and his divine status through the Shinto Directive in order to pave the way for extensive cultural and political reforms.
keep it up watching my videos to stay updated with my latest videos make sure to subscribe to this youtube channel by clicking the button thank you